Amen. Well, turn to uh, turn to somewhere in the New Testament, and we'll get there. Uh, go to Ephesians for now. God is good. Amen. Pray with an expectation, even in the dark, darkest times. Pray with an expectation. Uh, two or three weeks ago, whenever the last time I spoke, I can't remember. Um, I spoke on in Christ, and I want to kind of review that because I really felt that was important to declare where we are coming from, and uh, when we speak, where we declare from. So when we are in Christ, I stand in Christ. I am in Christ in my salvation. I am in Christ. For his power. I am in Christ for my healing. All that I need is in Christ. In ministry, I felt this was important to review too. There's too many people going around, well, I'm a pastor, I'm an apostle, I'm this, I'm special. You are nothing if you're not in the right place. Ministry is not the highest calling of God. Ministry is not the highest calling of God. The highest calling of God is being exactly where he's asked you to be. Could be a mechanic, it could be dental hygienist, it could be homemaker, it could be, you've got other things to do. Um, could be whatever he's asked you to do. Could be working with Crazy Patty in some of those nursing homes. Could be doing whatever he's called you to do. But where he's called, what he's called you to do is where you're supposed to be. That's where you'll be the best minister of the gospel. Yes, come on. Some have said, well, he's a missionary. Isn't he lucky? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. If you're in the wrong office, it's not, <laughs> it's not lucky and it's not good. Just do what he's called you to do. That's the highest calling. Because whatever he's called you to do, he's equipped you to do. If you step into an area that you might have some giftings in but not called to do, it's going to be a hard road, a very hard road. I get calls more and more from pastors. It seems to be a door that's opening up. And and some of them I can see the, the problem. Anyway. We're not perfect. And some tend to think they're perfect. And the rest of us can tell them that they're not. (laughs) But in Jesus' name, we just do the best we can. But when we're in Christ, it means we're walking with God. When we're in Christ, we're walking in everything that he has given to us to do and to be. And the first example of this was back with Noah. Remember, I was talking about Noah. When God led, led Noah into the ark, he led them into the place he was to be. And God closed the door behind him and said, here you go for the next year float in this boat god put him in the ark he protected them he gave them everything they needed i love this this line that that just came to me the ark was built according to his direction he shut the door and he watches over you like a parent no matter what the storms you're in the storms buffet the outside they don't come in in the inside they will never come in the water is meant to be on the outside there will be storms in life but Everything you need for the journey has been placed on the inside with you. Everything you need for your journey has already been packed away with you. That's good. That is worth framing and putting on your wall. That would bring you a lot of victory sometimes. Everything you need for your journey, he's put in the ark with you. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the Lord. We report for duty every day. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. Who has blessed us. Remember, I read this a couple weeks ago. This verse is just spinning me upside down. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Everything we need in heavenly places is available to us now in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. 
All because of what Jesus has done for us. He's our Lord. I report for duty. My relationship started as my Savior. Now he's, the, he's, he's my Lord. He's the one who's given me things to do. We have work to do. I was down, I uh, went with David and Joan Wednesday night down to hear Bonnie Shabda, and she was very much, that was her key line. It was a fabulous sermon. We have work to do. I'm going to paraphrase. You have a calling and a gifting and talents. It's time to go to work. The world's a mess. The world needs us. The church needs power and authority spoken, needs life spoken, faith spoken. There is work to do. There is work to do. There is work to do. The church of North America is not to be sitting in a pew. But we're to be out past the walls, doing the ministry that he's given to us. Jason and George are meeting people in the, uh, who are selling seed and selling fertilizer and mechanics and buying different things. They meet people I'll never meet. Teresa's working with her brother to business, meeting people I'll never meet. Gregory, where he is, meets people I'll never meet. Amy and Jeremy, wherever they are on the other side of the city, meet people I'll never meet. It's wherever God has placed you. He's given you a gifting and a calling, and we got to go to work. And more than that, every spiritual blessing you need is available through the door of Jesus Christ. We are in Christ. I don't know if you've noticed the little three-letter word in there. Who has blessed you? Amy, you're a grammar person or an English person. Has is what tense? Past. What's that mean? It's all sitting right there. It's all done. Already been done. Who has blessed us? He has provided for you. He has given it to you. Call it out. Speak it out. Declare it out. He has blessed you with every spiritual gift. It is finished, Jesus declared on the cross. That meant everything he came to earth to do is finished. Everything you need is finished. The door has been closed. The ark has been provided. The Holy Spirit's here. Everything you need, it is finished. Whatever you need is in you or in heaven. Call it down. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That means there's nothing that's not above your grasp. And these are spiritual blessings, much better than material blessings. We hear a lot about prosperity. We need to be teaching that there are spiritual blessings and they're heavier, they're longer lasting, and they're better for you. Spurgeon put it this way, Thanks to, to our God for our temporal blessings, for they are more than we deserve. But our real thanks ought to go to the God in waves and thunderous ovations of hallelujahs for our spiritual blessings, because a new heart is better than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to feed on the best earthly food. To be an heir of God is better to be an heir of a great nobleman with great lands. Because it doesn't last forever. To have God for our portion is blessed. And infinitely more blessed than to have hundreds of acres of land. God hath blessed us with spiritual blessings, and these are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of the blessings because they are priceless in value. I'd rather have health. I'm not saying one like money, money always helps. But I'd rather have a new heart. I'd rather have the promises of God. I'd rather have the portions of God. I'd rather be able to call some things that I need than to have to run around looking for answers. Let's flip over to Colossians. In Colossians, I'm going to do a quick overview of a couple of verses here. Colossians is a book where Paul again emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the preeminent thing in your life. You know, there are a lot of people in churches that go to church and they're wondering why they're in church. They get no life out of church. Have you ever talked to some of your neighbors and friends? They, oh yeah, I went to church yesterday. How was it? Oh, what do you mean? It's church. I mean, I love when they say, well, it was church. It was church. It was like going to the car wash, it was church. Like, Hopefully, church is more than that. 
hopefully church is where you cry in his presence and you're hungry for his presence and you'll you'll be touched by his presence and man so paul talks about that christ is a preeminent thing and that he should be first in everything we do and everything we desire we were talking about that water baptism today it's 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 an identif- identifying that publicly that I've accepted the Lord. I can take Jesus Christ, as, as George said, in the, in the barn. It could be at youth camp. It could be privately. Uh, it could be in your bathroom. It could be somewhere, wherever you meet Christ. But it's a public declaration. I want to stand and identify with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I want everyone to know that I'm making this commitment. And I want to tie myself to Jesus. I want to walk with him. And when you go into the waters of baptism, you're also saying, I want to do more and I want to walk like Jesus walked. It would be nice if it was magical that we went in the waters and everything was cut off. But we have work to do. When you go to school, you go to school to learn. When we become a Christian, we go back to school to learn. We learn the word, but this word is life changing. This word uh, will bring you peace and a joy that nothing else will. This word will steer you in the right direction for life. It will steer you in the right direction for marriage. It will steer, steer steer you in the right direction for finances and whatever you need. It's all encompassing because Jesus is the creator and knows the answers. As believers in Christ, we're rooted in him. And thanks to the cross, which we'll be celebrating this weekend, we are now made alive in him. Think of that, that the cross is a place of death, but we're made alive in him. It's a place of being nailed to the cross, giving up everything a sacrifice is given. Yet because of that sacrifice, we now have life. One of those... Interesting sayings. But thanks for the blood that was sacrificed. And thanks for the fact that we are now placed in the ark of his presence. Thanks to God that his Holy Spirit came upon us and and filled us and has empowered us. and, And is doing a work in us to change our heart to be more like him. Read Colossians uh, verses 13, chapter 1 verses 13 to probably the end. He has delivered us. God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed to us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So you've been taken out of darkness and put into a kingdom of love. That's a good transformation. In whom we have redemption through His blood. We've been redeemed. We weren't allowed to go near the throne room of God. We weren't allowed in His presence, but we've been redeemed. The price has been paid and the forgiveness of our sins. And he is the image of the invisible God, Jesus. You can't see God, it says. But remember, Jesus said to them, if you can't see God, but look at me. Even Peter, man, if you, man can you imagine, I think it was Peter. Peter, Paul, one of those two Ps, said, if you don't know how to live, follow me. And Jesus said, you haven't seen the Father, but look unto me. So he is the invisible, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things are created. So by Jesus all things are created that are in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him everything consists. For he is the head of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He was the first one that raised up from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. Keep keep Jesus first. Keep God first. Be careful in your language, even innocently. Sometimes we as speakers... Uh, teachers, sometimes our word slips in there and, I, you know, I was doing this and, and God and I were doing it. Be very careful. Keep God first and keep us out of it. Because, man, the Holy Spirit disappears quick on those things. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness dwells. What a fabulous verse. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, everything dwells. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him. Whether things on earth, there we go, we're covered. Or things in heaven, Jesus made peace through the blood of the cross. Wow. And you, look at this. You who once, again, past, who once were separated, cut off, alienated. You were enemies in your mind by the wicked things you had done. 
But now he, Jesus, has reconciled us again. Isn't that awesome? We were once separated. We were once alienated. We had no business being in God's presence. But God. And he has reconciled us. Verse 22, and in the body of his flesh through death, he came to present you holy. He came to present you blameless. He came to put you above reproach in his sight. Remember I had uh, Serena do that little thing, uh, putting the gown in front, in Christ. I'm walking around Dave Kelsey, but now I'm in Christ. I'm pure, I'm holy, I'm righteous. Not because of me, but I'm in Christ. So we have the chance here to be in Christ. I can go to the throne room in Christ. And he doesn't see Dave. He sees Jesus Christ. He sees the righteousness. He sees the power. He sees the the white, the beauty, the power, the majesty of Jesus Christ. And he says, I hear that cry of Dave, but I only see see Jesus. I'm going to give him what he wants because it's available to him. Because he's made a way through Jesus. That's good. You were once alienated. You were once enemies by your wicked deeds. But Jesus has now reconciled you by the body of his flesh through death. And he came to present you holy and blameless above reproach. Wow. Verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. We say this phrase a lot. The Christ in you. Where is Christ? If you're a believer of Christ, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, where is Christ? In you. And you have a hope of glory. And it's available to anyone. I asked this in the baptism class today. Who can be saved? Anybody. Anybody. Doesn't matter what your sin is. Doesn't matter what your background is. Anybody can be saved. In him we preach, warning man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. And to this end, this is why we have pastors, teachers, and leaders, youth leaders, worship leaders. This is why we have, to this end, I labor. We, we work to strive to his working, which works in me mightily. We have work to do. There's teaching to be done. There's leadership to be done. There's examples to be done. There's encouraging to be done. When you get a call, and, and in my prayer time Friday morning, I, I had to text Patty. I said, I'm, I'm going, I just feel I'm to do this, this, and this, and I got to go. And uh, I came by and saw Linda and said, I won't be at prayer time. I feel I've got to do something. And, and uh, it actually worked out beautifully because when I walked into the room, I was the only one there except for the mom. And uh, God knows. Just to speak encouragement, just to sit with them, just to sit and hold their hand. Sometimes it's not rocket science. Sometimes it's just being there for people. Sometimes when their kids are in ICU and the doctors are confused and can't figure out what's going on, sometimes they just need someone beside them. Someone to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with them. Sometimes they just need to know that God is more than... You know, in the Bible, but he's life and he's breath and he will send his angels. And sometimes he's calling you to be that angel. Verse 20, through the blood of the cross. How was peace made? We can't make peace with God. But Jesus made peace for us by dying on that cross. The blood of the cross speaks to us. Of the very real death of Christ. It's amazing how many people think of Easter as almost a fable now. Because it's so been removed from our our society. So removed from our schools. Uh, I remember we were running Spike program. And Jamie and Heather and I were talking about it again a while ago. As they work with some of the school kids and some of their outreaches. That these kids don't know anything about Easter anymore. But they sure know about the Easter bunny. How much more? Do we need to declare the truth? And there is someone who came to give life, and his name is Jesus. It is not a fable. The cross changed the world forever. The cross caused an earthquake. The cross caused it go dark. The cross caused uh, a collision, if you will, of two worlds. Caused heaven and earth to collide in this spiritual manner. 
And those who were once separated from Christ, verse 20, it says, we were alienated. What's pretty interesting about that, the root word of that means transferred. We were transferred from one owner to another owner. That'll preach anywhere. <laughs> I, was, I was in sin, but I was transferred to the heavenly kingdom. I was, I was in hell, but I was transferred to this kingdom. The blood of Jesus opened a door for, for me. I was once alienated, set apart. I was in another kingdom, but he allowed me to move into his kingdom. All because the blood made a way. We're no longer alienated. Because he made a change in the status of heaven. And he is reconciled to us. And he came to make us pure and holy. The Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a wonderful statement. It isn't our hard work. It isn't our devotion. It doesn't matter how many hours. I'm actually shocked at how many, and David I'm sure has met more than I have, how many people who call themselves missionaries and don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't get it. I've met people who've gone overseas to help people, but they don't preach the gospel. Well, why are you there? Well, I want to help people. What do you do on Sunday? Well, we, that's our day of rest. It's not your hard work. It's not your devotion. It's the power of the living Christ that's in you that brings change. God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, to pay for them, to make a way for forgiveness. Because there was no way I can live. And he gave us his spirit. Why did he give us his spirit? Because there's no way we can live the right way. We've got the Old Testament which shows us all the rules they were to live by. And nobody could meet the rules. So Jesus said, I'm going to make this easier. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And here's two rules. Love the Lord your God and love everyone around you. And I know you've met some of the people around you, but I need the Holy Spirit. But the neat thing is, sometimes, maybe he'll put Bruce and I, actually Bruce and I get along really well. But let's say we didn't. But sometimes he puts us together because he's trying to rub off some edges. And sometimes we think, well, Bruce needs fixing. Meanwhile, Bruce, Bruce is going, that Dave needs fixing. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit's going, you both need fixing. God said, I've come to dwell in you. And by my dwelling in you, I will give you the power you need to walk this life. So it comes back to the ark again, folks. He's put you in his ark. He has shut the door. And everything you need is in the ark with you. Everything you need is in the ark with you. Life will be hard. There will be storms. But there's going to be great victories. There's going to be great victories. There has been great victories. I was telling Janet the other day about some of the miracles and things that we're seeing and some of the lives changes. She was telling me what's going on in some of the services that they're doing. God is on the move. There is change going on. It's horrible what happened in Egypt, but it's going to continue to happen. It's horrible what it goes on in India. And I'm astonished that 170,000 people die every year for the gospel of Christ. And no one raises a finger and no one talks about it. Because Christianity doesn't matter anymore. But why are we astounded when the word clearly said that was going to happen? But who do they run to when there's a problem? They come knocking to your door. The pastor called me this week. He said, can you pray with us about a situation? He said, this couple, their, I think it's their teenage son, is in desperate, terrible situation. And the doctors have basically said, there's nothing else they can do. I said, so how did you meet them? He said, they came and knocked on the church door. <laughs> Folks, there's going to be a revival because they're going to be knocking on our doors. They're going to be knocking on your doors. When there is no hope, we have a hope. When there is no other way, there is a way. And when people turn their back on people, 
He's going to expect you to reach out with your hands and your, and your shoulders and give them a place to cry on. He's going to expect you to open up your heart and you're going to go, I can't have more room. And he says, yeah, you got more room. The people are coming and they're going to come to you. How often in the New Testament did it say they came to hear Jesus and what he had to say? How often did it say they sat down with, with Jesus at a Five Guys? <laughs> Or Jeremy's favorite coffee shop. They sat down and talked. We often think they're coming in here. you got to change your thinking, folks. They're not coming here. They're coming to the silos. They're coming to the tractor dealership. They're coming to the fields. They're coming to your doors. Because they know you have something different. And be bold enough just to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we take authority in this situation. And we expect a healing. Don't do a long prayer. Don't bore them, but be their friend, but speak with authority. And then you get on your knees at night. You get on your knees in the morning and expect God to do something with it. He's not going to bring them to your door to bring a failure. He's going to bring them to your door so there's lives changed and families changed. This city is going to be changed. We are so thankful that the power that Jesus walked in where the Holy Spirit has now been imparted into us. We are in Christ. And he comes to give you the capacity and the power to do everything you need to do. Turn to chapter 2 of Colossians. And I'll close with this. Haley, can you come and play something? Or Jillian or somebody. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ, the Lord, so walk in him. There's pretty simple instructions, isn't it? As you have received the Lord, walk in him. Be rooted, be built up in him, established in faith as you have been taught. Abound in it with thanksgiving. Abound in what? Abound in faith. Be built up in faith and abound in faith and have thanksgiving. I heard a pastor talking about the other day, if the church would learn to move in thanksgiving, they would see God move more. Be thankful for what God's put in your life. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Beware they deceive you according to the tradition of men. Man, we have so many rules in the church. Show me where they are in the Bible. So a lot of it's just tradition of men, which is rules meant to tear people down, not to build people up. And according to the basic principles of the world, not according, look at that. All of this stuff, nothing to do with according to Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus, there's everything you need and you are complete in him. Who is the head of all principality and power in him. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Aren't you thankful that we don't need surgeons to do surgery on our hearts, but God comes and does a work in us? By putting off the body of sins of the flesh and by the circumcision of of Christ, we are buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Man, we're going into baptism, but we're going to be raised like he was from the dead. And after you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him and forgiving you all trespasses. Remember, God says, if if I've forgiven you these trespasses, you better be forgiven others. It's a two-way street. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. And it was against us. It was contrary to us. He has taken it and nailed it to the cross. And I love this. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Shelby, what was that play we did a long time ago? Uh, Carmen. Was it Carmen? Carmen. I know we're dating ourselves by about 30 years, but the youth years ago, we did this little skit by Carmen. Champion. 
sure it's on YouTube somewhere. But basically, Jesus went down into what was portrayed as hell and made a mockery of the devil. And, and I love that. I've seen a couple different versions of it, but man, he just mocked him, made a spectacle of him. And he went, if you will, he went into his house, went into his place where he was the boss beat him up, threw him down, said, give me those keys and walked out. I left him just looking like a little girl. Okay. Point is, Jesus beat up our biggest enemy and we are we run in fear of him. Do you know in Revelation it says this? Remember the Lord showing this to me is one of those times the verse explodes. Do you know in the end times when everything is done, do you know who he sends after the devil? You remember this? One angel. <gasps> one angel is gonna go after the devil? That's what the word says. When it's all done in time and time to put him in the pit and tie him up, I'm going to send somebody for him. Just give me one angel. Actually, give me the junior angel. Why are we so fearful of things when one angel, we all have angels around us that are here to minister to us when God gives them the, whatever they're to do for us. He says in the end, Amy, go tell them to get, you know, send one one angel and tie that guy up and throw him in the pit of hell. We've had enough of him. One angel. I remember when I read that going, I had to read that. I got different versions of one angel. Like, and yet we're so terrified. We do have an adversary. But we have a savior who rose from the grave, took the keys from him, beat the snot out of him. And left him embarrassed. He left him embarrassed in front of the demons. He left him embarrassed in his own house. That's who Jesus is. And he probably sat in a stool and did it with one finger. We are complete in him. For in him is the head of the principality and power. In him you were circumcised. You were buried with him, verse 12. We were made alive in him, verse 13. He wiped away all the requirements, all the laws that were against us. And having disarmed and beaten and beaten to a pulp, Jesus made a spectacle of them and triumphed over them. You know, in history, when they used to defeat a king, they sometimes would gouge his eyes out, but they would drag him behind a horse or make him be led by a horse. And often he was led by a younger slave or they would do anything to embarrass the king. And they would parade the king into town. They would like taking him down Dundas Street. And the whole city would come out and cheer the army. And there would be this king being led along like a slave, beaten and tormented, his crown ripped, his, his, his robes whipped. Nothing basically, he was just he was just made a spectacle of because you wanted to embarrass the enemy. And that's what they did to Jesus, too. Problem is, for them, the outcome was totally different. In this little skit called Champion, it shows the demons having a party when Jesus was in the ground and buried, and they're having a party, just woo! He's buried, woo! It's over. And all of a sudden, what was that? What was that noise? What was what was that? Was that an earthquake? Oh no, I hear people praying. We should show that sometime. It was it wasn't over. When he said it is finished, they didn't understand what it is finished is about. But Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished, laying out a path, laying out a highway for us right into the throne room of heaven, giving us access to everything we need in heaven. Everything you need has been placed in your own ark, your own body for the journey. All you need is in Christ. 
Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Shelby, would you mind praying in a moment? I just want you to read that verse when you get home again. Ephesians 1, 3, 1 and 3. Maybe memorize it. But everything you need is in heavenly places. Everything you need for this walk, for this journey. You're in the ark. There will be storms, but the water can't come in and drown you because he's with you. It's like when Jesus was in the boat with the disciples. And we often misinterpret this. But when he said, you have little faith, he wasn't talking about the storm. He was talking about the fact I said, we're going to the other side. And they doubted his word. Don't doubt the word of Jesus. His word is true. Everything you need, everything you need for this life, everything you need for this walk, everything you need in this storm, he's given to you and is provided for you in the name of Jesus.